<laughs> All right, everybody. Daria Schmiller no, here. Earlier, I know. Here's my presentation, and good. Now we've got it. Here's my disclosures and no conflicts of interest, financial or otherwise, are declared pertaining to this presentation. And I've just been an independent business distributor for Beamer Vascular Physical Therapy Device uh, over the past year and a half. So the title of the talk is Good Vibrations. And what I'm in, what I, my topic of interest here is the role of microvascular vasomotion and healthy tissue perfusion and drainage and the relationship of altered vasomotion to chronic health conditions. And there's our learning objective number one, review the basic biology and natural history of small blood vessels, which comprise approximately 74% of all the vasculature in the human body. And I've tried to keep all my citations on the actual slide so that you can see them as you go. And number two, we wanna learn how microvascular vasomotion affects tissue perfusion and drainage in healthy tissue. Understand how impairment of tissue perfusion is a pathology common to hypertension, obesity, diabetes mellitus, as well as other metabolic, endocrine, and inflammatory disorders. Um, the area we're talking about, this is one diagram that shows a microcirculatory unit. So the area of interest, and I'm going to just try to use the cursor arrow. So we have our arterial, and then you have a meta-arterial, and then smooth muscle precapillary. They're called the sphincters. And this is part of what we learned in school about autoregulation, that these will open and close to help increase blood flow to a particular area based on demand or decrease it. Um, then you have your two true capillaries and the sizes are listed here. And uh, some capillaries, in, in this case, they can pass up, some of these true capillaries can pass substances in both directions. And the velocity is one millimeter second minus one. So that's really, uh, I think it's pretty, is that pretty slow? I can't remember what I read about that. Anyway, uh, capillary intermittence and then a chaotic movement of red, red cells and pulsation in this central area. Uh, and then you have your um, outflow basically to venules and um, uh, the larger veins uh, each step of the way. And there is smooth muscle still in the venous side and even in the lymphatic side, but it is more sparse. Uh, so as we look at capillary beds, uh, you've got the smooth muscle valves. This is just basically another review, and these are shown here nicely in this diagram. Um, and you have the meta arterioles, and, and those are here, I believe. Yeah, right here. Okay. And so going from a larger vessel to ever smaller vessels into a capillary bed, and it allows a flow through the capillary bed uh, and flow through the capillaries themselves. And then there's true capillaries. Here's your precapillary sphincter again. And that's, uh, these are all of those. And then this is what you would consider a bypass vessel in case uh, there's less demand or there's a need to divert flow out of this capillary bed. Uh, so that is the precapillary sphincter part of the story. Uh, it's a ring of smooth muscle. It opens and closes to control flow and it's regulated here it says by chemicals. Um, intermittent vas vasomotion, it's open to flow five to 10 times each minute. So that's our vasomotion. That's sort of an internal process, uh, rhythmic process that's independent of uh, neural input, cardiac input, and respiratory in effect. Uh, all of those play a role in uh, how vaso the types of rhythms seen in vasomotion uh, when it's recorded. And uh, laser Doppler flow of the skin is the most heavily researched mechanism for this. There's some retinal flow data out there, people researching, looking at retinal flow the same way. And uh, so that's where that comes from. This is a blow up view of the previous slide. And the reason I'm showing this one is um, it's easier, and I apologize, uh, it's a little bit blurry down here, but just to look at the anatomy. On the arteriolar side, uh, the definition is that it's less than 100 micron diameter, and it's the arterial, the capillary, the venule, and elements of the lymphatic circulation. And you've got the uh, tunica interna, endothelium, basement membrane, tunica media, and tunic, uh, tunica externa in this arterial. Capillaries is mainly a basement membrane and endothelium. And we get to the venule side, again, you have the, the same layers as you did in the arterial, um, and there is a little bit of smooth muscle there as well. Uh, but again, you know, as we all know, the venules don't have the same level of um, thickness of the wall as the, uh, as the arterioles do. So characteristics, what happens in the microcirculation for our bodies is delivery and exchange of gases, metabolic substances and hormones, and removal of waste products from the tissue beds. Um, it's involved in the regulation of coagulation and immune responses. 
Uh, the structure, of course, varies widely and is frequently adapted specifically to the function of the organ concerned. For example, in the heart, uh, there are no precapillary sphincters at all. So you, you won't have a sphincter closing down to cut off microcirculation to the heart. Um, uh, the role, now, the endothelium plays a very important role in this, as you can imagine, and we've all talked about nitric oxide in various uh, discussions, even the last two days. Uh, but we've got control of highly specialized blood tissue exchanges needed for nutrient transfer, signaling and immune function, uh, maintaining an antithrombic surface, and maintaining vasomotor tone in the arterioles. Um, this is where that glycocalyx comes in, doesn't it? <laughs> In fact, the endothelium can be viewed as one organ, a giant mosaic whose parts follow patterns that are shaped by environmental and developmental factors. Um, and it really plays a huge role. When you have endothelial dysfunction, um, what you're going to see, uh, even in cases of no presence of uh, atherosclerosis or hardening of the arteries, people call it, um, that will develop in sedentary lifestyle. It's seen in hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, diabetes, heart failure, estrogen withdrawal, age, smoking, homocystinuria, Prinz metals angina, and atherosclerosis ultimately can develop as well. Uh, you have adhesion molecule expression, cytokine release and growth factors grow up, and these are related to progression of atherosclerosis. Also, uh, with endothelial dysfunction, you can get thrombosis due to uh, platelet activation. And abnormal vasomotion, again, you can see myocardial ischemia, coronary spasm, and hypertension. And if you look at this, uh, it gives you a little bit of a molecular pathway where the endothelium uh, is where nitric oxide is created and then diffuses over to the smooth muscle to relax the muscle. And when this process um, takes on a, a rhythmical uh, expression, that's when you have vasomotion, only though when it is synchronized. If you get asynchrony between all those endothelial vessels passing that nitric oxide to the smooth muscle, then things will get out of sync, and that's where vasomotion, vasomotion can be disrupted. Um, I, this is the paper I passed out for everyone to read. I just got very excited when I read it, and I, Mark, after I heard your talk about light, I, I understand why you were excited as well. Um, uh, the title of the paper was Life Rhythm as a Symphony of Oscillatory Patterns. Electromagnetic energy and sound vibration modulates gene expression for biological signaling and healing. And it's just so beautifully written. It, it's, it covers so many different disciplines. I really encourage you to read the whole thing. It's, I think it's very inspiring. Um, some of the quotes I took from there, rhythms can communicate bioinformation that governs a wide variety of functions, including that of guiding living beings towards health and well-being. And from the cellular level to the whole organism, every signaling event is fashioned by rhythms as vibratory patterns. And that synchronization of coupled oscillations and dynamical systems is a crucial issue in the orchestration of essential processes of life. Everything from diurnal rhythms, biological clock, the whole thing. And biological clock setting life's rhythms. It is striking that experimental evidence indicates that transient changes in intracellular calcium homeostasis, rather than occurring in a manner corresponding to diffusion and passive transport, i.e. increasing from a baseline to a stable, long-lasting plateau, and then declining again, is orchestrated in real time by subcellular pacemaker sites producing calcium waves and oscillations. Thus, nature chose to create subcellular clocks to guarantee an exquisite regulation of calcium dynamics. It's essential for many processes. And like I said, it's not just... Um, the vasomotion piece of it. That was, or this paper refers to other processes as well. So in other words, more of a looking for a common thread, it seemed, um, on one, one perspective. And we found those common threads in all the talks that we've had here so far uh, of things that keep coming up again and again. And this, I'm just throwing in the vasomotion piece. So properties of microvascular vasomotion, and this is a definition I saw in many, many papers, uh, is it has been defined as the rhythmic oscillation of microvascular tone involved in the control of blood flow and tissue perfusion. Uh, vasomotion gives rise to oscillations and local blood flow known as flow motion. The characteristics of vasomotion appear to change in conditions such as hypertension and diabetes. Vasomotion may improve tissue oxygenation under certain circumstances, and that is from uh, this paper from 2011, Vasomotion, what is currently thought, and it covered quite a few different areas. I'm just trying to pick out some of the pearls. 
and properties of microcirculation. First of all, past those precapillary sphincters, you don't have systolic pulse waves. The heart does not push the blood in past that point. In other words, at that point, once that sphincter opens, when I was in med school a long, long time ago, it was felt that everything past that point was rather passive based on the pulsations of the heart and, and just a transmitted wave from the main vessels. But there has to be more going on and that's what was observed as technology got better to see uh, with things like laser Doppler flow and all, as, as technology gets more sophisticated and, and one of the uh, writers in one of these papers talked about nanobiology, the, the more we can image and see inside the body various ways uh, and get down to the cellular level of function, we get a better understanding of what's going on. Uh, intrinsic vascular oscillations permit normal tissue perfusion and drainage of metabolic waste and fluid from tissue beds. Microvascular vasomotion allows delivery of oxygen and nutrients to tissues and organs in response to cellular demand. Uh, now, the physiology of microvascular uh, uh, vasomotion is associated with oscillations in intracellular calcium concentration and in membrane potential, which I think we talked about quite a bit here this week. Pharmacologic, neurologic, and endocrine signaling affect vascular diameter. Uh, vasomotion actively involves microvascular smooth muscle cells, endothelial cells, pericytes, which are support cells for endothelium, especially in the capillary region, voltage activated cell membrane channels for synchronization of vascular tone oscillations. This is a very complex slide, but it, and it's actually from an animal study of rat mesentery. So uh, I try, I'm trying to stick mostly with humans, but I really love the schematic here talking about all the different physiology. And it's really hard to read, so I don't want to spend too much time on it, but you'll be able to refer back to this as you look at these slides. And I put this on a flash drive if anybody wants to download it today. Okay, next slide. But just so you know, that is pretty much a culmination of a lot of work identifying all these pathways. The nitric oxide's in there. There's so many different things in there. Rhythmic variations in blood flow independent of heart rate can be observed at a range of frequencies. And uh, this is from a paper just uh, titled An Association Between Vasomotion and Oxygen Extraction. This is from 2011. The effect of fluctuation in blood pressure approximately every 10 seconds, those are called Meyer waves, and can be observed in tissue at a 0 0.1 hertz oscillation in blood volume and flow. Rhythmic variations in blood flow between 0.02 and 0.05 hertz are thought to be induced by neurogenic activity. So that's parasympathetic and sympathetic input. The endothelium is considered to modulate vascular tone at low frequencies, less than 0.02 hertz, via the nitric oxide and endothelium-derived hyperpolarizing factors. Oscillatory components corresponding to specific mechanisms. And again, this is a little bit of a, a duplicate, if you will, of the previous slide, but a different paper. And, and this is from blood flow oscillations as a signature of microvascular abnormalities. And uh, it's actually biophotonics, photonic solutions for better healthcare. How about that? And from May, 2018, so this is a more recent paper. And this, again, they refer to the fact that studies show that oscillatory components include the influence of cardiac, respiratory, myogenic, which is the smooth muscle, and neurogenic, which is your sympathetic nervous system, and the endothelial activities. And you can see those frequencies, again, the very slow ones being endothelial and, and neurogenic. And in between is the myogenic, and then respiratory is a little bit faster, and cardiac has the most uh, alteration with the heart rate, uh, or the most frequency. So again, as uh, we understand that microvascular vasomotion assists in tissue oxygenation, um, the dynamic interplay of regulatory mechanisms results in a system that induces oscillations of blood pressure, volume, flow, and oxygenation. And on a second paper, isovolemic hemodilution increases the volume of oxygenated tissue as a function of vasomotion. O oxygen transients caused by flow motion oxygenate, oxygenate tissue domains, which under steady state conditions would remain anoxic. In other words, this oscillatory pulsation, if you want to call it that, or vibration inside the vessels facilitates oxygenation and blood flow through the actual tissue. Um, now, this was an interesting paper as far as adaption, adaptation, and we talk about evolution, but also adaptation, and looking at how uh, the Sherpa guides in the uh, 
at the extreme, and this was called the Extreme Everest 2 study, um, studying their skin microcirculation and comparing it to altitude naive lowlanders as they went up the mountains. And what the study <laughs> wanted to accomplish, the question was, what is the central question? It was, do Sherpa Highlanders who live up there all the time when exposed to graded hypobaric hypoxia exhibit enhanced vasomotor and neurovascular control to maintain microcirculatory flux and thus tissue oxygenation when compared with altitude naive lowlanders? And then what is the main finding and its importance? Here they found that Sherpas when exposed to hypobaric hypoxia at high altitude demonstrated superior preservation of their peripheral microcirculatory perfusion, a greater oxygen unloading rate and sustained microvascular reactivity with enhanced basal motion. In other words, by having a more pronounced basal motion response, they were able to optimize oxygen delivery in suboptimal conditions. These differences were not reported previously and may improve our understanding of the multifactorial responses to sustained environmental hypoxia. So again, just what was observed. And, and this is where I think right now, vasomotion has sort of been observed under all these different conditions and trying to piece together. And I have that, like that was one of my last slides, the big question there. But when you have this function of vasomotion, it seems to be identified in conditions resulting from impaired tissue perfusion. And when we see changes in vasomotion function observed in conditions resulting from impaired tissue perfusion, such as hypertension and diabetes, um, impaired tissue perfusion is suspected to play a role, for example, in neurodegenerative disorders. Impaired microvascular perfusion and drainage of metabolic waste leads to inflammation and tissue damage associated with metabolic, endocrine, neurodegenerative, and arthritic diseases. Uh, this is a very busy slide, but it, it talks about, and again, this is not, I'm not, this is just tissue perfusion per se, not mentioning vasomotion at all. But the reason it's important is because the understanding is now that vasomotion activity in the microvasculature has a positive impact on tissue perfusion. So when it's impaired, the tissue perfusion itself, that's where a, a number of the pathologic um, slides I'll show you later about disease processes also identified concomitant disruptions in vasomotion. So you have everything we've talked about here, you know, oxidative stress and inflammation, impaired tissue perfusion, this feedback loop in some ways, um, and how this could create a vicious cycle on itself. Um, talking specifically about myocardial ischemia and coronary microvascular vasomotion, the impact of hypercholesterolemia, and this is a busy slide as well, but that condition, hypercholesterolemia, produces the imbalance between superoxide anions and nitric oxide. And you can see now how that could potentially affect vasomotion if you're getting a disruption in nitric oxide. And uh, what, what's mentioned in the caption at the bottom, if it's hard to read, is that relevant mechanisms include increased expression of NADPH oxidase, and xanthine oxidase, uncoupling of ENOS, nitric oxide synthetase, enhanced quenching of nitric oxide by superoxide, in other words, it doesn't stick around long enough, increased um, ADMA by decreased activity of DOAH, and please don't ask me what those are right now, I'm not having to go back to the paper and look up the abbreviations. Um, again, like I said, this gets into a lot of biochemistry that is a lot to swallow, but just to understand that all these pathways have been identified as to how um, high cholesterol causes an imbalance in uh, vasomotion and blood flow. You were asking about the different waves and the noise. If you look here, here is what's recorded from the microvasculature with the laser Doppler flow and see all the squigglies. That's a combination of the intrinsic vascular oscillations. It, it includes the EKG tracing sort of reflected as that pressure wave transmission, passive part, and then resp respiration as well, which also creates its own pressure uh, cycle in there. So that's why it looks so noisy, but uh, a lot of the papers talking about vasomotion studying all those different waves, they, that's where all the math equations came in that I'm not an engineer and understand very well at all. So but it was impressive that by using, again, more modern technology, all those individual waves could be teased out 
in my mind, it kind of reminds me of when you're recording voices and it's a noisy room and uh, the guys at NSA can dial out all everybody and just get one voice isolated, at least on the TV shows. Anyway, it's, you could use that same kind of technology here to separate out where these other patterns are coming from that are being recorded. Uh, myocardial ischemia during mental stress, the role of coronary artery disease burden and vasomotion. And that's what this paper was studying. It looked at physical stress versus emotional stress. And the major finding in the study is that neither the angiographic extent nor the severity of coronary artery disease in people that were having cardiac conditions, that's, that's why they're being studied in the first place, is associated with the risk of developing myocardial ischemia from mental stress, suggesting that vasoconstriction, but not the severity of the coronary artery disease is the pr predominant underlying mechanism of this condition. And the myocardial ischemic response is predominantly due to microvascular constriction. So, and again, that's understandable because we understand that the sympathetic nervous system, um, the alpha noradrenergic um, receptors are going to cause vasoconstriction. So if somebody's having a lot of emotional stress in their cardiac patient. I think everybody in the room is probably taking care of someone like that. It, this emphasizes the importance of why trying to alleviate that emotional stress any way you can, it's important. So I like to try to get some tips for my two dogs, they're basset hounds. And <laughs> that is a threat-free posture. Um, this, this is Baron, he's 14 and a half. And this is Zoe, she's six, and they love my couch. Uh, but yeah, so we need to be more like these two and just try to be more relaxed. And uh, especially if we have a cardiac problem. Now, vasomotion and venous disease. Uh, this was an interesting paper and it's, it's a bit older. It's from May of 1991. Um, uh, observations here were abnormalities of the capillary microcirculation may be important in the pathogenesis of venous ulceration. So now we're talking stagnation of flow. Metabolic factors on the arterial or smooth muscle and autonomic innervation at the precapillary sphincter may also play a part. Ulceration of the skin often occurs in patients with lipodermatosclerosis as a result of venous disease. And I believe lipodermatosclerosis, if anybody knows more about this, is a condition due to venous stasis. And it's related to hypoxia from barriers to oxygen diffusion again. And this was another paper I wanted to share with you, coronary microcirculation and the no reflow phenon phenomenon. And this is a problem when somebody has been resuscitated from a myocardial infarction and you give them uh, angioplasty or uh, TPA or something. And when they do the cardiac cath after, there's an area where the blood's not getting into the small vessels. And uh, this has a lot of different contributions. You've got your mechanical obstructions here, and then you have this whole section here, and there's an overlap at the bottom of microvascular dysfunction on the right. And this is really hard to read. So um, microvascular dysfunction occurs when the endothelium, again, remember how important that is, of, micro, of the microvasculature produces an impaired vasomotor response to vasodilators and vasoconstrictors. Uh, so that's nitric oxide and adenosine, or serotonin and endothelin-1, respectively. At the uh, same time, inflammatory regulators like TNF-alpha, tumor necrosis factor alpha, yeah, and what's that other one? B-selectin act locally, enhancing inflammatory status. So then you have the leukocytes coming in, and uh, there's ratios of subpopulations that play a role, a distinct role actually in this process. And then increased um, redox state remains a vicious cycle. And again, there's a lot to this. There's the cholesterol uh, crystals, hyaline formation in vessels. And I don't wanna get too much into all the pathophysiology of arteriovascular disease, but it all starts to snowball. And you can see you get a vicious cycle through all of this. So you have physical obstruction and then functional obstruction uh, due to vasospasm or lack of 
leading to lack of flow. Um, now we're going to shift gears and we're going to start getting into the met metabolic uh, disorders. Uh, so we have meal-related increases in microvascular vasomotion motion are impaired in obese individuals. And this is considered a potential mechanism in the pathogenesis of obesity-related insulin resistance. And again, just keep remembering that anything that's going to affect microvascular vasomotion is going to affect tissue perfusion. So you can easily substitute those two words. And so what was found in this particular study, and this is from Diabetes Care, May of 2011, microvascular dysfunction contributes to high blood pressure and impaired insulin-mediated glucose uptake. Obesity is associated with microvascular dysfunction. Microvascular function in steady state versus dynamic, that is, i.e. meal-induced hyperinsulinemia. Possible pathophysiological mechanisms for obesity-associated microvascular dysfunction are probably multifactorial. Um, there's adipose tissue that secretes hormones and cytokines. There's increased activity of the renin angiotensin system with insulin likely mediated by sympathetic activation which has been shown to be more pronounced in obese compared to lean individuals. And then microvascular dysfunction is a key element to the development of obesity-related hypertension and insulin resistance leading to hypertension and type 2 diabetes. And then uh, I'm just giving you a couple more recommendations uh, to look at here. I didn't want to break all these other studies out, but one title was body mass index is related to microvascular vasomotion, uh, hearkening back to the one we just talked about. And this is partly explained by adiponectin, which is one of those secretory factors. And then lipid profile, cardiorespiratory function, and quality of life of postmenopausal women improves with aerobic exercise. Everybody in the room knows that. Um, so we know that already. Now, impact of vitamin D supplementation on arterial vasomotion, stiffness, and endothelial biomarkers in chronic kidney disease patients. And the conclusion of this study published in March of 2014 is that in conclusion, this study for the first time demonstrates that colocalciferol, vitamin D3, improves endothelial vasomotor and secretory function in stable non-diabetes stage three out of four chronic kidney disease patients without any significant effect on arterial stiffness, calcium, and FGF23 levels. Now I wanna get into cerebral, cerebral vascular effects with, that have been studied with vasomotion next. Um, this is a very interesting paper. Effect of cerebral vasomotion during physical exercises on associative memory, a near infrared spectroscopy study. And this is from July of 2017. So as we have a new technique to be able to study the microvessels in a live active individual, uh, uh, here near infrared spectroscopy was used. Um, the subjects had 30 minutes of medium intense exercise and that enhanced the consolidation of associative memories. Uh, second, uh, that the uh, SD, that's the standard deviation of the uh, he oxygenated hemoglobin signal and the power over all three components of vasomotion, endothelial, neurogenic, and myogenic, are higher during exercise as compared to rest. And memory performance increases due to exercise due to exercise, so that the memory performance increased due to exercise correlates positively with the neurogenic vasomotion component and negatively with the endothelial component. So the smooth muscle, uh, I'm sorry, the neurogenic component affecting the smooth muscle played a larger role than the endothelium. So overall, these results suggest that the modulations of vasomotor activity over the prefrontal cortex during exercise are associated with enhanced memory consolidation. Now I know I, I got a lot of good ideas when I was swimming for long periods of time, how to solve problems that I was having with patients. It, it really is amazing, far more than with meditation. Um, the next paper I want to talk about quickly, detailed view on slow sinusoidal hemodynamic oscillation, oscillations on the human brain cortex by Fourier transform, that's math again, I think, oxy-deoxy hyperspectral emergence, okay? Oh. Uh, again, I didn't want to get too much into this, but I, I just like the bottom punchline to share with you. Observed SSHOs may embody a local propagating hemodynamic wave with velocities in line with capillary blood velocities and conceivably related to vasomotion and maintenance of adequate tissue perfusion. So the two are linked everywhere you look. And this one I just added this morning is vasomotion and cerebral arteries impaired in Alzheimer's disease, and it's from 2015. 
And I apologize again, we have a very complex diagram and without my reading glasses, I'm gonna have trouble reading the, at the bottom there. But these are all hypothetical pathways uh, of impaired vasomotion. And the amyloid B protein is upregulating CT1 causing vasoconstriction and cessation of vasomotion. So right there, you've got the amyloid affecting blood flow. At least this is a hypothetical pathway. And again, when you get this, just blow the screen up and I can send you all the original papers too. I have them all on my computer. Um, but I thought that was another fascinating piece of this. Now, um, sepsis. Endothelium dependent vasomotion and in vitro markers of endothelial repair in patients with severe sepsis. This is an observational study. Um, and I'm just delivering the punchline here. And this was from 2013. Vascular dysfunction plays a key role in the development of organ failure, which strongly determines outcome in sepsis patients. In this study, they evaluated cellular markers of endothelial function and in vivo reactive hyperemia, which is increased blood flow to an area. For those who don't know, that's when you turn red and flush. That's hyperemia. And in a group of 30 patients with severe sepsis and compared results to a group of healthy volunteers. And what was found that in sepsis leads to in vivo endothelial dysfunction, again, which coincides with reduced cellular endothelial repair capacity. That's been going for a long time. Yeah, that's, that's, that's an oldie. Uh, but again, it, it's just sort of going with the common theme that tissue perfusion is causing a lot of problems, and whether it's been identified or not. But the reason I felt like this was so important is if we're trying to give external medical treatments, to chronic illnesses, and the chronic illness is due to poor tissue perfusion. If what you're doing with medication alone is to try and get a drug to a part of the body, or your super beats to your nitric to make nitric oxide, it may not get there because of the tissue perfusion problems that already exist. So ancestral principles, everything we talk about enhances tissue perfusion. So that's why people get better with the diet and the exercise and the sleep and everything that we have been discussing um, and getting away from inflammatory foods and, and all the conditions that uh, relate to that because like the body has to start fighting way too many battles. But if we don't have adequate tissue perfusion for cellular function, uh, that's where we're gonna get in trouble with health issues. So tissue perfusion for proper cellular function occurs by the microcirculatory vessels, the little guys which make up 74% of all the body's vessels. That's a huge, you can wrap it around the earth, I think a couple of times if you, or I think I heard that mentioned once, once or twice. The micro vessels exhibit vasomotion to optimize blood flow to the tissues. Um, vasomotion is influenced by local factors via the endothelium, the nitric oxide pathway, the vascular smooth muscle, respiratory function, cardiac, and autonomic neural input. So these are all components of autoregulatory function. And dysfunction of microvascular vasomotion is identified in myocardial dysfunction, sepsis, metabolic disorders, hypertension, diabetes, et cetera. Optimal health is intimately connected to normal tissue perfusion via responsive microvascular vasomotion, enhanced by, like I just said earlier, proper diet, exercise, and correction of metabolic dysfunction. The role of microvascular vasomotion for drainage of tissue metabolic waste and toxins demonstrate the relationship between impaired vasomotion and toxic and inflammatory processes, again, leading to chronic illness. So now here's the big question. Is it a chicken or an egg that comes first? Is microvascular vasomotion compromised by chronic illness and injury? Or is dysfunction of vasomotion leading to decreased tissue perfusion and drainage the underlying etiology for these conditions. And it could just be that it's just a wicked feedback loop and as things get worse, they get worse. So obviously it's an egg, but which egg is it? So um, that's why, you know, it came from a dinosaur at some point and ended up a chicken. So anyway, that's my talk. Thank you very much. Who's got questions?